Um, so, company value in a rant of epic proportion. Uh, this isn't the title in the book, but I realize everybody's talking about monetization, and you're going to get beaten over the head with how do I make money off of free games. So, I'm going to tell you how to make your company uh, one that people actually care about, one that people want to work with, um, and how to build, in some ways, a, the company culture the right way. So I go, who am I? And I want everyone to know that I have 23 slides, all of which came together in four minutes, um, because I've done this parts of this probably 600 times. So that's me in China. I have the same shirt. It still fits for five years. Um, I don't have the hat anymore. So what I do. For the last 18 years, I've been doing lots of things. Um, I've been the CEO of several companies. Some have been acquired. Uh, I'm a mentor to lots of startups. I've helped them through the fundraising process. Um, I've known Jason for years. When he left his, his last gig, I actually helped mentor him a little bit. Um, I've launched a lot of online games, work with a lot of management teams. And the problems that people tend to run into, uh, I say I'm not a rocket scientist. Um, and common sense is actually pretty rare. But when somebody tells you something that seems like so basic from the outside, it's like, oh my god. Yeah, we should do that. This is pretty much what I do. I'm, I'm kind of that voice of reason who comes in and, and says what you already know you're supposed to do, but then you believe it because I have all this experience. So it's a good thing. And people pay me money for that. So talk about creating studio value. There's a number of drivers of valuation, the, what makes your studio worth money. Uh, one of the main things you could do is you could actually ship a good game. Uh, a hit game would be really good for your studio. People want to work with studios that, that have very successful products. Um, Rovio, nobody would have done a deal with them until they had Angry Birds. And once they had that, they became a studio everyone wanted to work with, and then they didn't need to work with anybody. So it tends to be the way. It's just like raising money. No one wants to put money into you until you don't need money, and then everyone wants to put money into you. So it's, it's a funny conundrum. You could exhibit a sustainable business model. This is a, a great thing. What if you actually know how to do an app monetization, or you're actually building a 20% margin when you have a consulting business or you're outsourcing? You're building a real business long term that makes money. Uh, when you generate capital, people go, OK, this is, this is a business. This has value. This is worth either acquiring or it's worth partnering with. Um, they're not going to go under. Very important to make sure you have a, an effective business model. The biggest thing here for me is the quality of the products you put out. While you can put out your first product and it really doesn't matter, as, as Jason said, when you get into reusing your tools and tech and you're focused in a certain area, quality is so important. It represents you as a, as a studio. It represents your creativity. It represents what you're capable of. And a lot of times people will, will take a project and they say, oh, I can work for $40,000 or $50,000 to build a mobile game for Kraft or some advertising brand. Well, in reality, that game probably costs eighty, one hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars $100,000, $200,000 to build. And what people do is they, they try and build it really just to the specs. They don't build a quality game. They build something functional. It's not fun. Uh, the kids will go in and they save their Rice Krispie monster one time and they never come back. Um, but if you invest the time and build the quality product, people will actually find that it's fun. Um, that's the most important part. Build something that's fun and just iterate on it. Iterate, make something better, put your own time and effort into it because it's your representation of who you are, what you can do. Reputation. If you're known for being really great at something, then people want to work with you. If you have a poor reputation, obviously, they don't want to work with you. But we're talking about the positive things right now. So you want to have a good reputation. Anytime you sign up for a project, try and deliver it on time. If you can't deliver it on time, tell them when you're 50%, 70% of the way along, hey, we're having problems. I'm going to be two weeks late. I'm going to be three months late, however, however it's going to turn out. But give them that level of communication and heads up. Because your reputation for communication is better than OK, so where's the product? Oh, well, we didn't know how to tell you. Uh, we really screwed it up, and now we need a lot more money. That never goes over well, and you'll never work again with that person. And then they tell everybody. Um, that's one thing. We're in, we're in a very small industry. It may be global. There may be thousands of studios around the world. But 
eventually everybody talks and everybody knows the same people or they know people in common. And you will find that, oh, those guys, yeah. They screwed up that one deal that one time. They couldn't build the Kraft macaroni and cheese game. Mm, you know, they're pretty bad. And no one wants to work with them. Uh, over time, you'll build relationships. And relationships are based on your reputation. They're based on the quality of your games. Um, and people go back to people that they work well with. So if you do a great project with me, I want to go back to you again. I don't want to try somebody new unless you've gone and screwed up, and then I'm going to try somebody new. Um, the factors that actually do affect this is there's always somebody who's going to be cheaper than you, right? Five years ago, I would say if you went to China, things were inexpensive. Uh, the Ukraine, three years ago, things were inexpensive. Mexico, two years ago, things were inexpensive. Right now, the rest of Latin America is seen as inexpensive. But Africa is on the horizon, and I'm telling you, people, people in Africa are going to be building games in five years, and they're going to be less expensive. So you can't be focused on just the price. You need to build the quality. You need to build your relationships now, because five years from now, when these people go, hello, you know, we want to build your game. We'll do it for $20,000. Crap, we can't compete with that. But we can compete with having a good reputation, with having good relationships, and being known for, for building a product that you know, everybody wants to play, everybody believes in. So the other side, limiters, negative stuff, which is the exact opposite of the other slides. I had to spread it out because there's no way I was going to get to more than four slides otherwise. Um, if you ship something that has not found an audience, too niche, too casual, too crappy, um, if you build a game that, that really is not good, it's not going to, to help you. It's not going to make people go, oh, wow, did you play this really awful game? The only exception I have to this is I worked with a studio called Stickman Studios down in New Zealand uh, back in 2010. And they were trying to get experience on the Wii, and they shipped a WiiWare game uh, about dragons. It was the lowest rated game ever on the WiiWare platform. They sold 30,000 units at $10 a piece. So the second crappiest game ever sold 600 units. So by being the worst game, they actually made a lot of money. So if you can't be the best, be the absolute worst. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they built off of that and actually make great games now. Um, but yeah, you don't, you don't want to make crappy games. Crappy games, everybody can make crappy games. I can't program. I could build a crappy game. Uh, if you have a really bad business model, like if your business model is, okay, uh, we'll ship the game, it costs us 80000 to make, but they pay us 60000 and then we'll borrow 20000 from mom and dad, and then ask them, okay, so the game wasn't successful, let's go out and get more money. That's not a way to run a business. Um, I have lots of hobbies. I like to collect baseball cards. I like to watch TV. I like to go to movies. This is a business. This is not a hobby. If, if you have a shit ton of money, you got a million bucks in the bank, enjoy. Have fun. Build games that nobody cares about. Um, have a bad business model. Have no business model. Uh, but if you're going to be in this industry, you better have a smart business model. You better learn. You better listen to people uh, because otherwise you're going to be out of business. And you, you can't rely on, on governments. It, governments are great, and you guys have excellent support here. They have excellent support in a few other countries. But what happens is as the industry matures, the level of government support tends to go down because they go, okay, now we're a fully functioning industry. They need to have business models, and they need to be running real companies. And you'll find over time that some of the, some of the studios will kind of fall out because their business model was built around getting support uh, from a source that isn't a consumer, isn't a B2B relationship. Um, but you're very lucky right now that you have such great support from the government in the different ways. So utilize that now while you build your business models and figure out how to do your monetization uh, and all the other parts. So the biggest thing that we've been talking about uh, over the last day is how Colombia is being seen. OK, cool, Colombia, I can build things there. It's safe. Yeah, I get it. But oh, it's very low cost. You're not the low-cost leader. You need to value your time and value your work. If the average man month is costing between $3,000 and $3,500 fully laden for all your studios, your taxes, everything for a person, you need to be charging at least 20% above that. You need to be charging $4,500, somewhere in that range, in order for it to be effective and in order for people outside of Colombia to respect that you respect yourselves. And this is very important because if you charge too little, 
people see it as, oh, we can get cheap stuff there. Not, hey, it's high quality, these are, these are well-trained people, they go to university, they have great skills. And this, this is a problem that lots of emerging uh, game cultures have and, and game industries have, is getting people to respect them. But it's also because the, the, the actual communities need to respect their pricing, they need to respect what they're providing. Um, there's a lot more value than, than they'll give you. I mean, you guys charge one-third of what it is for someone in the U.S. And people in the U.S., they're bitching about it the whole time. Like, oh, they don't pay me enough money. $10,000 per month, they bill me out it. Oh, I only get 8000 Hey, you know what? People work their ass off here, and they work their ass off for less, and you're going to get a better product because people are engaged. So I'm, I'm a little disenfranchised with a lot of the stuff happening in, in the places that are already established. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you get a bad reputation, the best thing you can do, close your company, start a new one. <laughs> <laughs> You have the same relationships. You're like, oh yeah, but we don't work with that guy anymore. That you know, our art director, we got rid of him. He's he's in a different company. Um, but yeah, literally, the only way to get past a bad reputation, or if, say you go and take some venture money and you screw over your investors accidentally uh, by making really shitty products, yeah, re-roll. Oh yeah, sorry guys, we're gonna build build a new company. You only get one chance to have a good reputation, right? After that, people are like, eh, yeah, those guys. Uh, yeah, so one of the biggest things that I've seen in pitches over the last several days is that, hi, we're a three-person team, here's the four games we're working on. Hi, we're five people, here's the six games we're working on. It's like, geez, how can you work on so many games? You're, you're not that many people. Well, it makes it look like there's a lack of focus, especially because the games are not all in the same genre. They're not reusing tools and tech. Um, here's my soccer game, here's my racing game, here's my my game where you match three, and here's the one where you shoot arrows at something. So, guys, what do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I tell everybody, focus. Pick something, do it well. And I probably have two more slides that say the same thing in different ways. Be the best at something, right? It doesn't matter what you do, just be the best at it. Um, if you want to make real-time strategy games, play every real-time strategy game out there, take every piece that's good, and then build a better real-time strategy game. The, the greatest example of this is Blizzard. If you look at World of Warcraft, their first MMO game, it's considered probably the best MMO game of all time. But they took pieces from every game that came before, Dark Age of Camelot, EverQuest, Shadowbane. They did nothing new. They just pulled all the pieces together in a new way. And everyone's like, oh my god, this is amazing. No one's ever done this. It's like, no, everyone's done every piece of that. But they were the best at synthesizing the pieces that were the most fun and putting them together into a game that's better than anything else out there on the market. Uh, so you can't see the whole slide here, but journalists are basically worth the cost of replacement. So if you're going to sell your studio and you bill out at a certain rate, if you do all sorts of things, you're like, oh, we, we do our game with the frog and we do our game over here with the, the sports and our racing things, generalists are not worth anything. The value is how much it costs to replace you. That person there, if they make $25,000, $30,000 per year, is replaceable for $25,000, $30,000 a year because they don't have specialized skill sets. But if you're specialized and it's like, here's somebody who's an incredible game designer who works on turn-based strategy or asynchronous mobile games. Um, here's a back-end engineer who is the best database programmer around. Those people add value. They add value to your, your products. They add value to your studio. So. Generalists, no one's interested in, in working with a generalist. I've, I've never seen a publisher go, hmm, these guys can do all these 26 different kinds of games. Let's work with them. They go, no, who can build us an RPG? And they start going through the list like, Bioware? Oh, wait, no, they're owned by somebody. Obsidian? Oh, okay, we can talk to them. And they literally go through, it's called the short list. And they figure out who can build that kind of game. And over time, while you're building your reputation, you're going to go in and you're going to talk to them potentially about the original game you have to pitch. Here's our game, and here's why we want to make it. And they'll look at it and they'll go, hmm, this is interesting, but we don't want to build your game. We want you to take an existing IP that we have and turn it into that type of RPG or strategy game or puzzle game. Um, and then sometimes you'll get very lucky if you have great IP, and there are some studios down here that have done this, and they walk in and people go, oh my god, this is so awesome. It's better than anything we could have come up with. Let's build your game. Um, that's the ultimate goal, right? Build the game you actually want to play which makes everybody feel good. 
Build something high quality in every way. I already talked about quality. High quality. It's, it's not that hard to take the extra time and sit there and go, let's not ship a, a bag of crap. Let's ship something that people actually want to play, they want to replay. Um, and even if you ship a product that doesn't have all the features that you want to have in it, and you take it to market and go, if we have success, here's the first thing we're going to add. And then we're going to add the PvP elements or multiplayer. And then we're going to add this piece. You can tranche what you're going to do. Just make sure the part that you ship is the best that it can be. Uh, so about growth. Slow and steady wins the race. You can't see the Valve logo here because apparently it's black on black. Um, but it's better to, better to grow slowly with the right people than grow too quickly. Valve was uh, launched back in 1996. Today they have 400 people. Um, they had a few people leave a few months ago who probably weren't a good cultural fit with the company. I'm not going to comment on that. I don't want to get sued. But, uh, you know, they have a good culture. It's very flat. And people feel empowered to work on the projects they want to work on. But when you think of high-quality games, do you think of Valve? I do. I think of Blizzard. I think of Valve. I think of people who take the time and the effort. But it's also because the people they hire are specialists. They're not generalists. They're the best at something. The alternative, of course, is, you know, if you grow too fast, Zynga went from zero people to 2,800 people in a period of two years. I don't know how you can interview that many people in two years, um, let alone know that they're a good fit for your company. Um, and as a result of this, they laid off another 500 people in June. Well, that's never good because when 20, 25% of the people who've come into your company are now being laid off, it makes it look like you don't know what you're doing as, as a company. That, wow, they don't either know how to make products or they don't know how to hire the right people or it's an awful culture. And now they have all those 500 people plus everybody else that live, everyone's going, Zynga sucks. It's a cancerous organization. The CEO is awful. You know, all these things. All they get is 10 times the amount of negative energy coming out about Zynga, about how it's the most awful place on the entire planet. And no one wants to go work there. Nobody talented that I know of will go work at Zynga. They'd rather be homeless on the street, you know, begging for money than work at Zynga. <laughs> and that's, that's basically the talk. I have, uh, I have lots to talk about. I'd rather hear your questions, uh, if anybody wants to ask questions. That's my email address. I respond within 72 to 48 days, somewhere in that way. <laughs> <laughs> but any questions in the audience? Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, if anybody wants to go out, we're going to have a smoke break, and uh, we'll probably go have some beer. <laughs> <laughs> Gracias.